Hi, I'm Meredith Warren from the University of Sheffield, and I'm reading my paper, The Sweet Hereafter, A Sensory Analysis of Perpetua's Vision. Um, and first of all, I'm really sorry that I'm not able to present this paper in person, um, visa issues, living in the UK. Um, but I'm really disappointed that I can't be there myself because this looks like a really amazing panel. And so I'm not just sorry for inconveniencing everyone, but also because I would really like to be there to hear the other papers myself. Um, and I'd like to thank Angela and Greg for being um, so flexible in the face of my uh, late, um, basically saying that I'm not able to fly in. Um, if you'd like to ask me questions about this paper, or give me some feedback, um, I'd love to hear from you. My email address is m.j.warren at sheffield.ac.uk. And I'm also just, you know, sitting at home following the hashtag for the SBL. So if you'd like to at me on Twitter, um, you can reach me at Dr. MJC Warren. So on to the paper. Perpetua's heavenly meal of cheese occurs in one of several visions described in the martyrdom of Perpetua and Felicitas. Her experience has been uh, viewed frequently in terms of the historical early Christian meal types. And while this is far from inappropriate, a sensory analysis of uh, cheese and its uh, taste better illuminates the function of Perpetua's vision. Perpetua's bodily and emotional changes after her meal require explanation, which a sensory analysis can provide. After Perpetua experiences the sweet taste of the cheese, she knows that she's no longer um, able to have a place in the earthly world and she gives up her earthly cares. While before her meal, she's anxious for the well-being of her child, after her vision, she and her child have no anxiety for each other and even her breasts no longer ache with milk. The taste Perpetua experiences imbues her with the heavenly knowledge which is experienced by her in an embodied way. This reading is uncovered through examining parallel visionary taste experiences in other Jewish and Christian texts, which I refer to in this paper, but are more fully explored in my forthcoming book, including Joseph and Asenath, Fourth Ezra, and Revelation, among a couple of others. So using a sensory analysis of taste, I propose that Perpetua's um, cheese meal um, represents a shared understanding of how the ingestion and tasting of otherworldly food in narrative grants access to the divine realm, and thereby transmits divine knowledge. And this is a literary trope that I'm calling hierophagy. The privacy of taste, as opposed to the shared senses of sight or hearing, implies that um, participants in this kind of eating experience God in the most intimate way. And this is, I think, what's going on with Perpetua. So hierophagy, as I define it, is a mechanism by which characters and narrative cross boundaries from one realm to another. The basic event of hierophagy involves the eating of something otherworldly, which associates the eater with another world in one or more of three ways. First, hierophagy might bind the eater to the realm in which the food originated, for instance, heaven. Second, the eater might be physically or psychologically transformed by the food. They might gain new abilities or have a new appearance. Third, hierophagic ingestion can grant divine knowledge. Perpetua's ingestion of the cheese given to her by a heavenly figure facilitates her transformation in two of these ways. Namely, she becomes associated with the heavenly realm and loses her connection to the earthly realm, and she also receives divine knowledge, which she is then able to share with her companions. Before analyzing the taste experience, I should outline the scene's place within the narrative. The Passion of Perpetua and Felicitas is a composite text and includes first-hand martyrdom account from the perspective of the formerly respectable uh, Roman pa uh, matron, uh, Perpetua. Perpetua's prison diary records the hardships faced by her fellow male and female Christians, including her pregnant slave, Felicitas, and also several visions experienced by Perpetua while in prison. Perpetua experiences physical changes or sensations in her vision that have ramifications in her waking life. Her physical transformation in the vision of the Egyptian, for example, signals her victory, um, just as the ingestion of the cheese somehow signals her martyrdom. Thus, Perpetua's vision of eating cheese, the vision under discussion here, should be understood primarily as indicating some change, both cosmic and earthly. The vision begins with a request. Perpetua is encouraged to ask for a vision to know whether she will be martyred. 
With confidence, Perpetua requests the vision and is given one. In it, she climbs a ladder up to heaven where she's greeted by the inhabitants and fed cheese. The text reads, Then I saw a wide open space, a garden, and in the middle of it a gray-haired man sitting down. He was dressed like a shepherd, tall, milking some sheep. People dressed in white were standing around him, thousands and thousands of them. Raising his head, he looked over at me and said, Welcome, child. And he called me over and gave me a mouthful or so of the cheese he was milking out. I cut my hands and took and ate it. And the people standing around all said, Amen. Then I woke up with the sound of their voice still in my ears, and I was still chewing on something sweet. Right away, I told my brother. We realized that we were facing martyrdom, and at that point, we gave up our hopes for this world. And that's Martyrdom of Perpetua and Felicitas 4, 8 to 410. Perpetua's hierophagic event then takes place in this vision. That divine knowledge is transmitted through dreams and visions was part of the cultural understanding of the relationship between the divine and human worlds. Perpetua's visions are therefore meant to be taken as true predictions of what is to come. However, Perpetua's vision gives her knowledge through a very special mechanism, which is the cheese she is given by this heavenly shepherd. The symbols found in Perpetua's dreams have communicable meanings that made sense both to Perpetua, who correctly interpreted them, and to her readers, given the popularity of the text, at least in North Africa. Several manuals for interpreting dreams, including the 2nd century CE Onira Criticon of Artemidorus, also suggests that there were commonly held understandings of what different elements of dreams meant for the waking life. Perpetua's visions begins with her seeing this tall bronze ladder in 4-3. The ladder is so narrow that only one person at a time would have been able to climb it, and so tall that it reaches the sky. It's embedded with various sharp weapons on the rails, the kind of weapons that might have been used in the arena to, tar to torture potential martyrs. At the foot of the ladder is an enormous serpent to deter those who would ascend the ladder. In Perpetua's vision, she is with Satyrus, who climbs up the ladder ahead of Perpetua and encourages her once he gets to the top. Perpetua defiantly uses the head of the serpent as the first rung and climbs the ladder. The image of the ladder situates the heavenly realm as physically above the mortal realm. That this garden is heaven is confirmed by the crowd Perpetua sees in the heavenly garden, since they are dressed in white, just like the angels Satyrus sees in his later vision in chapter 11. The central figure that Perpetua sees is a tall man with gray hair who's dressed like a shepherd. This is presumably God. He welcomes her to paradise and feeds her um, some of the cheese that he has produced from the sheep that he's milking. This is the central hierophagic event, the significance of which I'll discuss shortly. But in brief, she's, held, uh, she's fed by the hand of a heavenly being in a heavenly environment. Awaking from her vision, Perpetua retains a sweet taste in her mouth that reminds her of what she's uncovered. Tokens, which are items received in dreams, were expected in ancient prophetic dreams. And Flannery writes that these tokens, quote, illustrate the shifting borderline between dream world and waking world, end quote. In Greek dreams, it's fairly common for physical tokens to continue to, quote, remain in uh, the waking world, and that's from Lishut, uh, Greeks on Dreams. There are two aspects to Perpetua's receipt of the token. The cheese on its own represents a token in that it is something given to her in the dream world. The taste is the persistent part of the token that remains with Perpetua upon waking. This taste, as token, confirms the reality of the dream world, the heavenly realm to which Perpetua now finds herself belonging spiritually, if not yet uh, ontologically. Divine interaction in dreams, as established by the presence of this token, yields, um, as Flannery says, extraordinary knowledge, healing, divine sanction, or their opposites. In Perpetua's case, her ingestion of the token grants her special divine knowledge, but also allows her to relocate symbolically to the heavenly realm. This token, the cheese and its sweet taste, is at the heart of Perpetua's vision. In my book chapter on this event, I have a section on cheese symbolism and cheese making and cheese and dreams and cheese in North Africa. And disappointingly, I had to cut it uh, for this shorter version. But if you want to know what cheese has to do um, with any of this, please stay tuned for my book. Or you can email me and tweet me and I'll tell you. 
Um, however, given that much of the discussion about the meaning of this scene centers on the food itself, I'll leave uh, some very brief discussion. Um, so in brief, as far as I'm aware, um, despite there being some contradictory interpretations about dream cheese in some of the Oniromantic texts of antiquity, there's no direct parallel in extant literature to heavenly cheese. Part of the issue in interpreting Perpetua's cheese rests in the translation of the Latin, Caseum, since when Musarillo translated Perpetua, he actually mistranslated Caseum as milk rather than cheese, and his translation was likely influenced by his belief that the Caseum was related to baptismal imagery, taking his cue from Tertullian's description of post-baptismal milk drinking in De Corona 3.3. However, the straightforward meaning of caseum is cheese, not milk or curdled milk, and as I will suggest, um, below baptismal imagery may not be the best lens through which to view this type of eating. Milk and cheese frequently seem to represent an idyllic antediluvian world in which animal sacrifice has not yet become a practice. Perpetua's juxtaposition of milk with blood, and that's the text, not the character, uh, and imperial violence creates an order in which divine peace is represented by lactation, motherhood, and milk. Perkins points out the consistent uh, description of Perpetua as a nursing mother, and the graphic depiction of Perpetua and Felicitas in the arena as maternal bodies dripping with the signs of recent motherhood is striking. The juxtaposition of violence with milk also occurs um, in the chapter four, however, in the very vision under discussion here, the weapons on the ladder are likely to cause pain and bloodshed, whereas the peace of the garden Perpetua enters is associated with the cheese she ingests, pastoral, calm, peaceful. Perkins interprets this first vision to be an inversion of the maternal role Perpetua has uh, performed thus far, whereas before she provided milk to her child, she is called a child here and given cheese. However, the image would be more directly related to uh, both of these contexts if Perpetua had drank milk rather than ate cheese, and therefore I suggest that this meal does more than simply evoke nurturing pastoral images of the heaven Perpetua is about to enter. Before offering up my own understanding based on the implications of the sense of taste, I'll briefly outline some of the uh, socio-historical contexts used by other scholars to interpret the cheese meal. So first of all, uh, Eucharistic meals. Um, very briefly, there are attested groups in antiquity that use cheese as part of Eucharistic practice, and McGowan in his Ascetic Eucharist outlines several such groups. One of these groups is called the Artotiritae, the bread and cheesers, which appears to be much later than the 203 CE when Perpetua was written um, and is mentioned by Epiphanes of Salamis. Um, another author, Ephraim the Syrian, preserves a Marcionite practice that confirms through critique the use of milk as a Eucharistic beverage. However, neither of these texts uh, documents cheese Eucharist taking place in North Africa, and so it's not clear the extent to which this context should inform our reading of Perpetua. More likely than a Eucharistic parallel, um, which seems to be largely confined to Asia Minor, is a baptismal meal, which is attested to in North Africa. Several scholars identify the cheese meal with baptism, which for Perpetua takes place prior to her vision in 3-4. This association is despite the fact that in her own words, Perpetua does not directly connect her cheese meal with her earlier baptism. Baptismal meals of milk and honey are known from the 3rd century, and Tertullian is an excellent witness to the kinds of meals Perpetua and her fellow martyrs might have been familiar with since he writes from the perspective of a Carthaginian of the 3rd century, just like Perpetua. Tertullian does mention a meal of milk and honey after baptism in his De Corona 3.3. In this ritual, the catechumens renounce Satan, are immersed in the waters, and then receive a drink of milk and honey as their first food as Christians. The newly baptized Christians take this meal all together as a cohort. This meal is distinct from the Eucharist, which Tertullian mentions uh, separately in that text. Uh, Tertullian does not use the word caseum as Perpetua and Felicitas does, and rather refers to milk or lactis. 
In addition, perpetuous actual baptism, as I mentioned, occurs earlier in um, chapter 3 and with little fanfare. Um, the section reads, it was during this period of a few days that we were baptized and the Spirit told me to ask uh, for only one thing from the water, bodily endurance, end quote. It is possible that the usual post-ritual milk ingestion was curtailed in the prison context, but her request for a vision in chapter 4 does not seem to emerge from this baptismal context. Most other readings of this account recognize that the cheese experience is transformative in some way, but all disagree as to how. I suggest that viewing the mechanism of that transformation as hierophagy demonstrates that the cheese is not simply an allusion to baptismal meals or Eucharists, but is a literary trope common to other texts of the ancient Mediterranean, whereby individuals who taste otherworldly food are affected in fundamental ways. So the most important aspect, in my opinion, to take into account is that Perpetual herself does not seem to interpret her meal in light of either of these known Christian rituals. The meaning she takes from the vision in which she eats the cheese does not emerge from her baptismal experience, nor does she explicitly or implicitly connect the meal to any Eucharistic or baptismal practice, which do, um, and the Eucharistic practice doesn't um, occur in the text elsewhere either. Perpetua's other visions likewise correspond to, rather than stand in for, real-world events. Her vision of the Egyptian foreshadows her own experience in the arena. The cheese meal, therefore, should not be understood as merely standing in for what might have been ordinary post-baptismal meal practice in her community. Instead, its significance should be understood as coming from the vision's role in the text. This cheese meal is interpreted correctly by Perpetua as she interprets her other revelatory experiences. In other words, even if the ingestion of cheese in chapter 4 emerges from a real-world situation in which newly baptized catechumens were fed milk and honey, and I'm not convinced that it does, the fact remains that in Perpetua, the vision of the meal affects a different result than simply her induction into the Christian community, heavenly or otherwise. It is because Perpetua awakes from her vision still, quote, chewing something sweet, that she recognizes her fate. Analysis of the narratological effects of the scene sheds more light on the significance of the meal than do comparisons with historical ritual meals. As in Revelation chapter 10, verses 8 to 10, where the seer tastes a sweet and bitter scroll, Perpetua's hierophagic experience also involves sweet-tasting food. Perpetua emerges from her vision with this sweet taste in her mouth. And this sweet taste is evocative of the heavenly realm all by itself, even apart from the heavenly location of the eating. Divine food, such as ambrosia and nectar, taste sweet, as texts such as Wisdom of Solomon 1921 and History of the Rechabites um, in several places in, uh, illustrate. The Wisdom of Solomon describes the manna, the food that has come down from heaven, as ambrosias trophes, while the history of the Rechabites recounts how the inhabitants of the Isles of the Blessed consume water that comes up from the ground tasting sweet like honey, that is, like nectar. That Perpetua tastes the sweetness of the cheese she ate in her vision even when she wakes up confirms that the vision was true and that the food she ingested has special ramifications for her relationship with the heavenly realm. Understanding how the sense of taste works is key to understanding Perpetua's experience. First of all, anthropologists have demonstrated that sharing taste experiences with others establishes a bond among the eaters. A bond is accomplished through the intimacy of taste when compared with the uh, other senses. If smells evoke the presence of the gods in public, then taste, in the mouth and on the lips and the tongue, represents interaction with another realm in a very private way. In the act of eating and tasting, the sense object is actually internalized by the taster. For this reason, this form of interaction with another world has more profound repercussions than, for example, mere discourse with a being from a foreign realm, or being simply in the physical location of that other realm. Tasting otherworldly food brings about a bond between the eater and the, uh, food, the realm to which the ingested food belongs. Taste accomplishes this transformation because of its intimacy and this privacy of the sense of taste as opposed to the shared objective 
um, senses of sight or hearing suggests that hierophagy exploits the intimacy of taste to express its meaning. The social implications of sharing this intimate sense in antiquity supports the idea that tasting food from another realm alters the eater. In the social world, sharing a meal creates a bond not just between co-eaters of the meal, but also between the provider of the food and the consumer of it, as in the case of um, God and Perpetua. Hierophagic eating therefore creates a bond between the eater of the food and the giver of the food, even when the provider of the food resides in a different realm, the heavenly realm. Anthropologists argue that food also creates a bond between the eater and the provider of the food through its incorporation into the consumer. In eating food, the eater brings into him or herself the qualities imbued in the food, including the social or other stratifications implied in the meal, the culturally loaded symbolism of the food itself, um, and the memory of previous meals consumed in similar or different ways. The fact that Perpetua tastes an ordinary food, cheese, in an extraordinary setting, paradise, and that it has an extraordinary taste, sweetness, creates tension between the sociological ramifications of tasting food and the ontological associations with taste symbolic meanings. Perpetua's interpretation of the vision resides in her correctly interpreting the implications of the sweet taste she still has upon waking. There are two important aspects of the dream uh, analysis that have impact on how we understand Perpetua's meal when we examine them in light of sensory criticism. The first is the fact that she emerges from her vision with something still in her mouth, this token of something sweet. The presence of the sweet taste in her mouth, even while conscious, represents um, the tokens used in ancient dream descriptions to establish the dream as a true dream, divinely granted, as discussed above. Second, ancient analysts of dreams worked on the understanding that the soul and the body were distinct entities capable of separating from one another in certain circumstances, particularly in death and in dreams. Perpetua's soul is affected by this vision in that it is relocated to the heavenly realm by ingesting the cheese, an aspect of hierophagy that we see in other certain contexts as well. The fact that Perpetua's dream self, her soul, tastes the cheese brings about its relocation to the heavenly realm so that when it returns to Perpetua's body, Perpetua is thus aware of this change and responds to her earthly context accordingly. Perpetua's relationship to the earthly realm has been altered in two ways. First, Perpetua is given earth, uh, heavenly knowledge. Given the position of the event in the text, it seems clear that it is through taste that she realizes she will be martyred. As soon as she relays her vision to her brother, they realize that from now on, they would no longer have any hope in this life. This was the knowledge that she sought to receive in asking for the vision, whether to expect martyrdom or freedom. The knowledge she will be presently martyred comes from the cultural knowledge that tasting food belonging to a world of a different category somehow associates the eater to that world, a ramification we also see clear uh, clearly in the event of Persephone's pomegranate that you can see in Ovid. The latter might be enough to demonstrate to Perpetua that she will undergo violent trials. The cheese alerts her that heaven has already welcomed her. As such, the second implication that emerges from the cheese vision is that Perpetua has become irrevocably associated with the heavenly realm. Perpetua's symbolic translocation is observable through several shifts in the text. It's clear that these shifts um, through these shifts, that because of her mouthful of cheese given to her by heavenly uh, being, she's no longer concerned with her earthly family, nor with this world at all. When Perpetua meets her earthly father again in the next section, it is he who has tears in his eyes, not Perpetua, who has no emotional response. This is in chapter 5, 1 and 5. Perpetua's concern is no longer for any earthly thing, and this becomes physically apparent when Perpetua later attempts to breastfeed her child and finds that her milk has dried up in chapter 6. This lack of anxiety for her earthly family is in stark contrast to her worries about her child in chapter 3 prior to her vision, which are alleviated only when the baby is allowed to stay with Perpetua in her jail cell. After her vision, her father takes the baby and immediately her milk dries up and she has no anxiety for her child. Her allegiance has shifted because of her vision. Her concerns belong to the heavenly realm, not the earthly realm. Thus, there are two significant implications of Perpetua's meal, implications that are comprehensible when viewed through the lens of hierophagy. 
Perpetua is relocated, symbolically at first, but eventually through her death as well, into the heavenly realm through her taste experience. She knows this because of her vision from God, which she correctly interprets as foretelling this relocation. Immediate physical changes also come about. She stops lactating and no longer cares for, his child, for her child. This change in knowledge that she's to be martyred in location, that she will therefore leave her earthly existence, and in behavior, her lack of anxiety for her earthly family, is because Perpetua understands the implications of her hierophagic experience. She now belongs to the heaven she's experienced in her vision. Perpetua's case illustrates some fundamental ramifications of tasting otherworldly food and therefore of hierophagy. The knowledge that she will be presently martyred comes only from the cultural knowledge that tasting food from another world allows the eater to cross the semi-permeable boundary between heaven and earth. It's apparent that both Perpetua and her brother in verse 10 are familiar with the implications of eating otherworldly food and understand the consequences. Viewing Perpetua's vision of heaven in light of hierophagy therefore illuminates several aspects of the narrative. It's now clear that, aside from the pastoral associations governed by cheese, the taste of the cheese as sweet signals its association with the heavenly realm, and that by eating it, Perpetua has accepted her place in that realm. In other words, hierophagy facilitates the relocation of the eater. Further, Perpetua is aware of her fate in that she recognizes that her path forward is to martyrdom. Hierophagy transmits heavenly knowledge. These two aspects of hierophagy are present in Perpetua and Felicitas and become visible only when analyzed in the context of otherworldly taste in the form of hierophagy. Thank you.